Good morning and welcome to the service at St Andrews. We pray that this time might be a time of of encouragement, this time might be a time of of joy, and we pray that you might, through the hearing of God's word and the singing of his praises, that you might be encouraged as we spend this time together. Let us pray. Father, you are awesome and mighty. You are great and beyond our comprehension. But yet you gave your son Jesus Christ as the exact representation of you. That we can see your kindness, your grace, your love through the way that Jesus Christ lived on this earth. Oh Father we thank you that we can come to to worship you this morning. Use our words, use our, our thoughts, use our prayers to bring glory and honor to you. And then Lord use the message from the word to drill into our hearts. So that through our lives we might glorify Jesus Christ because we are living in honor and praise of him. So we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Let's bow in prayer. Almighty Father, we thank you this morning for this opportunity we have to come before you. Lord, this has been a week of, of tremendous upheaval in our country. We've seen crime and violence. We've seen political division. And as well as the uh, level four lockdown and the, the corona uh, COVID-19 deaths. Lord, all of this is very concerning to us. We lay our lives and our country before you. Lord, move in this land of ours. Stay the hand of Satan, that it might be, uh, we might see an end to the violence. We ask that you might continue to, to work in the hearts of people, that we might, as a, a collective community, turn around to the minority who are causing these problems and say, this is not acceptable. It is not acceptable to, to destroy, to loot, to steal uh, on such grand scale. Oh Lord, we pray that you might give leadership in this country a, a wisdom and understanding that they might stand firm for, um, the, for justice, for truth, for righteousness. Give wisdom to our president, Lord, as he leads this country, give him a, a, a strong sense of, of leadership uh, that he might take the country uh, out of this chaos uh, into a semblance of, of peace and order and direction. Lord, we pray for the churches, that as the church we might stand up and declare that what is going on is wrong, that we might call people to repentance, that we might call people to live lives that are, are, are right and good. And by our example, we might share with those around us that we live for you in every way. We also take this opportunity, Lord, to pray for our church, St. Andrews. Lord, we're going through uh, difficult times and compounded through the coronavirus and what is going on. Continue to, to be with us. Continue to be with our leadership that we might uh, grow the church in ways that we don't even understand, so that in turn we might come through this with a sense of, of purpose, of direction, and that we might see St. Andrew's uh, growing again, uh, from going from strength to strength. Lord, it's been a long time that we've been uh, oppressed in some ways by this, this virus. It has taken its toll on our congregation. So we ask, Lord, that every single member might know that they are still part of our family, Lord, and that they might understand that together we are the body of Christ. We think of those who are ill. We thank you, Lord, that even in their illness they can cry out and call on you. We thank you, Lord, that you have already moved, and we pray for healing. We pray for rest restoration, and we pray, Lord, that you might continue to uh, touch people's lives. We thank you, Lord, for those who've had uh, the coronavirus, uh, those who suffer from COVID-19 infection, and have overcome it. And those, Lord, that are still there and still uh, concerned, and some are in lockdown at the moment, uh, in isolation, Lord, that you might draw near to them, and that you might strengthen them at this time. That fear that people have over this virus. Lord, take away that fear and give them a sense of, of peace because they are in your hands. So we pray and ask all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. The reading is taken out of 1 Peter chapter 3, reading from verse 8 to verse 22. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 8. Finally, all of you, live in harmony with one another. Be sympathetic, love as brothers, be compassionate and humble. Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult, but with blessing. Because to this you were called, so that you may inherit a blessing. <clears throat> For whoever would love life and see good days must keep his tongue from evil and his lips from deceitful speech. He must turn from evil and do good. He must seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, 
and the ears, and his ears are attentive to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Who is going to harm you if you are eager to do good? But even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear what they fear. Do not be frightened. But in your heart, set apart Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. It is better, if it is God's will, to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. For Christ died for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive by the Spirit, through whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison, who disobeyed long ago when God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. In it only a few people, eight in all, were saved through water. And this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also. Not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a good conscience towards God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at God's right hand with angels, authorities and powers in submission to him. This is the word of God.
As we come to God's word this morning, let us pray together. Almighty Father, we thank you for this opportunity we have to come before your word. We just pray that you speak to us and guide us, direct us through your word. So we pray and ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're in 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 3, and we're going to be looking there this morning at, at harmony. This week has been exactly the opposite, hasn't it? Not only are we have the pandemic, and not only do we have the coronavirus, not only is there a whole set of, of strictures on us because level four um, lockdown, but now amidst all of this, we have this, this absolute chaos erupting in our country. We have people marching, people trying to unsettle the political um, um, position of the country. On top of that, we've got this, this violent streak and this, this looting and, and everything going on. And it's just become such a, a, a hotbed of, of mess, really, in our country. And a lot of people are very concerned and very worried. And we have a call to prayer that we stand up and ask the Lord to undertake for that. That he might stay the hand of Satan, that he might stop this violence. We pray for wisdom for our leaders and for those in authority, for the, for the police, um, for the military, that they might be able to handle this as they should um, and that it might not get out of hand. Either that they're overzealous as the police or that the violence and the looting might increase. So we've got all of this going on in the country, but in some ways it's no different from Bible times. Although it wasn't people looting and rioting and trying to destroy and burn places, the Christians were under great pressure. The Christians were, were suffering, and Peter writes this book to them amidst that. I came across that song, and I'm, I've known it for many years, and I'm sure you know it as well. It's by the New Seekers, and they sing about not only singing in harmony, but harmony in life itself. I like to build the world a home and furnish it with love. Grow apple trees and honeybees and snow white turtle doves. I like to teach the world to sing in perfect harmony. I like to hold it in my arms and keep it company. I like to See the world for once, all standing hand in hand, and hear them they go through the hills for peace throughout the land. That's the song I hear. Let the world You see, they, they're trying to give the idea that if we can sing in harmony, if we can just get everybody a nice home, make sure that we all live together in peace, then we just have harmony. But it's not like that. Life is not like that. I'm sure you can think of at least one person in your life that you are not living in harmony with. You can think of many people around you that are not in harmony with others. We can see people that are divided along racial, ethical, and, and moral lines. We can see those who are, are rich and those who are poor, and we can see in between there's a whole mess of, of society that really struggles to see the other person's point. And that is exactly what we are faced with in society today. But the Bible says to us that there's got to be a moral or a harmonious overflow from the Christian life. There's got to be a harmonious overflow because as Christians, we stand together under the headship and the lordship of Jesus Christ. 
You got your Bibles open? Look with me, if you will, at chapter 3 of 1 Peter. It starts off, wives, in the same way, be submissive to your husbands. Then it talks about husbands in the same way. What's it talking about in the same way? Well, just as Christ was obedient to his father and laid down his life in absolute sacrifice and humility, so we in the same way in our relationships do this. Not only that, he says, but it is imperative that as Christians, as those who follow and love the Lord Jesus Christ, that we need to give ourselves to first following the Lord for the Lord's sake. And then that will govern our relationships with others. See, if we look at that and we think our world around us is, has become so unsettled, we need to realize that the rock, the foundation that we have is Jesus Christ. Look with me, if you will, at verse 8. It says, finally, all of you live in harmony with one another. Live in harmony with one another. How do we do that? How do we live in harmony? Well, he gives some suggestions here. He says, not only is there harmony, but there is sympathetic, love as brothers, be compassionate and humble. Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult, but with blessing, because to this you are called for that, so that you may inherit a blessing. There he gives us the idea of what it means to, to have a unified, harmonious life, living in harmony, but being sympathetic, being compassionate, seeing the other person's point of view, not only me, myself and I, but looking to other people. See, striving for harmony must be, for a Christian, a way of showing the Lord Jesus Christ in my life. Showing the Lord Jesus Christ. See, Jesus is the one who is there for us. And Peter lays it out very carefully in this book for us. He lays it out very carefully saying, this is how you are to live. Look at the first one there in verse 8. We need to live for Jesus Christ. There's the living for Christ. That we put Christ in the middle of that. He says so in verse 10. Whoever would love life and see good days must keep his tongue from evil and his lips from being deceitful. He must turn from evil and do good. He must seek peace and pursue it. There it is. In, in a nutshell, how do we live for Christ? He lays it out in verse 8. He talks about harmony, sympathetic, love as brothers, be compassionate, be humble. Don't repay evil with evil or insult with insult. But, he says, we need to be blessing each other because to this you are called so that you may inherit a blessing. See, that is what we are called to do. We are not called to be at, in, in antagonistic relationships with one another. We are not called to be in a, a sense of upheaval all the time. We are called to be in a sense of unity. We talk about that as, as Christian love. We talk about that in a way that as Christians we stand together under the love of Jesus Christ. And that love is shown in and through us because he loved us first. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12 verse 25 it says this. So that you, there should be no division in the body but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. Now in 1 Corinthians 12, he's talking here about the body of Christ. We have been all been given gifts so that we can feed back into the body to build the body up. So there should be no divisions. Not because one has been given this gift or that gift. And the same is true in, in our lives, in harmony with one another. It says here, if one part suffers, then every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, then every part rejoices with it. Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is part of it. See, if we see ourselves as, as part of a body, we don't start hating our hand because it was out of the bed last night and it was freezing cold, and now my hand is cold, so I hate my hand. No, we'll bring the hand in to warm it up because it's part of the body. We can't take care of it. 
in the same way as part of the church. We've got different members here, different people in the church here at St. Andrews, in the Church of Christ worldwide. And God has given us gifts that we can feed in, build and grow each other. It's not a competition. It's not a one-upmanship. It's showing the love of Jesus Christ in the body of Christ. From everything we've read so far in 1 Peter, it seems strange that Peter would have this the sudden shift of gears. He's been talking here about the fact that we have been blessed with everything in Christ, the fact that we are a royal priest in a holy nation. He says that we're not uh, visit or we aliens and strangers in this world, but we are um, set for service to the Lord. We see that we have been set apart for God's glory and that we are to show that through the way we are in relationship with others as we submit to one another. So here we see that Paul does this quick shift and then he, he starts dealing with the issues in the church. He says, now I know there's divisions, I know there's strife, I know there's problems, I know there's been fights and if we boil them down and I've done this so many times with my, my own uh, self, invariably the relationships that have broken down is because of pride and because of I have my mind set and this is what I'm going to do. And no matter what the Bible says about harmony and forgiveness and go and sort it out with your brother, what do we do? We hold back, we get more angry, we get more frustrated, we then start laying more blame on the person and invariably either they don't know what's going on, they don't know why you're so upset, or they, they think that the problem has been solved. Meantime, you're the one stewing and, and getting more and more frustrated. And they're oblivious to your, your problems. So yeah, Peter is saying, in the church, let us live in harmony. It's not the harmony that the new seekers are singing about. It's a harmony that is at the very core of who I am. I choose to live in harmony. I cannot change you. I cannot change anybody else. I can only change myself. I can change the way that I view you. I can change the way that I, I forgive you. I can change the way that I love you. I can change the way that, that I want to relate to you. But if I just keep holding on to that grudge, to that hurt, to that frustration, and it might be justified, the only person I'm really destroying is myself. The only people that, the uh, person that I'm really um, breaking down is me, is me. And we find that a lot of people are carrying those burdens around. He lists there in verse uh, 8, he says, be sympathetic. Understand the other person's position. That's what sympathy really means. Sympathy is not, oh, shame, it's all going to be okay. Sympathetic or being sympathetic is that I understand where you're at and I will then give you the benefit of the doubt. I could be very angry with many people and I could say, well, they did wrong to me and I will never forget them, forgive them. Or I can turn around and say, just as I am a broken man, being forgiven by Jesus Christ. I realize that you're in the same boat as I am. And I know there's hurt. And all I can do is forgive. That's all I want to do. I want to forgive you. I want to live in a relationship with you. You see, that's up to you. It's up to me. It's not for the other person to change. You know, the Bible never says, go and make the other person forgive you. He says, if, if your brother has wronged you, you go and ask for forgiveness. You go and make it right. But you see, in this world we are told, no, I'd rather cut you off and nothing to do with you. And as Christians, we are condemned by God because that is not the way. Could you imagine if God became affronted every time that we sinned? 
You, my child, I love you. I sent my son, Jesus Christ, to die for you. And now you go and sin again. I've had enough. Could you imagine if God was like that? See, God is full of grace and kindness. And it says that in everything, Jesus Christ came and he suffered and he faced all the temptations just as we did. Yet he was without sin. But he understands where we're coming from. See, to love his brothers, to be compassionate, to be humble, not to, to treat evil, it says here, not to repay evil with evil or insult with insult. You insult me, I'll insult you. You hurt me, I will, I will repay. I will make sure that I get my own back. There is certainly a negative trend that we, we see in this country. If I can't get it, if I can't earn it, if I can't work for it, I will take it. I'll either take it by force, or I'll take it by some scheme or some means. And sometimes it's those people who, who are most successful for doing it the wrong way get more praise and more accolades than others do. See, as Christians, we're called to be different. As Christians, we're called to not be like the world. We are to be like our Savior, Jesus Christ. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, don't repay evil for evil. Don't insult for insult. But with a blessing, because to this you are called, so that you may inherit a blessing. See, there it is. If we want to live for God, then there must be a blessing. Romans chapter 12, verse 16 says this. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Don't be conceited. See what it's saying? It's all about my pride, my status, where I am. He says, there are people of low position. We should be with ones that show love. And it says, associate with them. It says, do not repay evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everybody. If possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. The Peter and Paul are saying the same thing. We live for Christ. And that is that we seek harmony, we seek oneness, we seek unity, we seek peace. You can ask any couple that are married, that if they are in each other's faces and they are always biting and, and nipping at each other, that marriage doesn't last and it crumbles. The trust that is there, the commitment that is there, the love that is there gets eroded away because of the, the antagonism that is there. And that happens amongst Christians as well. We need to live for Christ. In verse 10 and 11, we see there that Peter tells us that whoever would love life and see good days must keep his tongue from evil and his lips from deceitful speech. He must turn from evil and do good. He must speak, seek peace and pursue, pursue it. He must turn from evil, verse 11, and do good. He must seek peace and pursue it. Here he's quoting from Psalm 34, verses 12 onwards. And he's saying, if you want to seek and see long life, then be honest and do good. It says, do good and seek peace and pursue it. We need to be honest. Honest to those around us. Turn from evil. Turn from what is wrong. And turn from the deceitful speech. And do what is right. So often our words are di directly opposite to how we are to live for Jesus Christ. Words can be there to edify. Words can be there to build up. Words can be there to encourage. Words can be there to comfort. But words can also be there to destroy. To break down. To make people feel so inferior that eventually they start crumbling themselves. 
But if we are living for Christ, right at the end there, that quote out of verse 34, it says we are to be honest and we are to do good. Isn't that a wonderful way of just saying living in harmony means we have to be honest and do good. Secondly, we see not only living in harmony, but we live in God's blessing. God is, is, wanting, is always wanting to bless us. God is wanting to pour out His grace upon us. Look with me, if you will, at verse 12. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and His ears are attentive to their cry. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Who is going to harm you if you are eager to do good? But even you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear what they fear. Do not be frightened. But in your heart set apart Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and harmony. Well, in your heart set apart Christ as Lord. And we will know the blessing of God on our lives. When we get our relationship with Jesus Christ right, then we will know God's blessing on us. Peter was instructing these Christians what to do. He says, be honest, do good. He says, now, if you do that, you'll know that God is going to come and bless you. What's he saying? You are going to face trials. You are going to face difficulties. As Christians, we are going to face those problems in our lives. However, however, we need to stand up and give an account of who we are. Let's go back to, to verse 15, and it says this. But in your heart set apart Christ as Lord. In our heart set apart Christ as Lord. When we put Him first... Then, when people come and confront you, we need to be aware of that. It says, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this in gentleness and respect. See, we need to give an answer. But we do it with gentleness. We do it with, with respect. Look at verse Matthew chapter uh, 10, and verse 18. On my account will be brought before governors and kings as witnesses to them and to the Gentiles. But when they arrest you, do not worry about what to say or how to say it. At that time you will be given what to say, for it will not be you speaking, but the Spirit of our Father speaking through you. Matthew chapter 10, verse 18 to 20 says, You'll be before governors. You'll be before rulers. You'll, you'll have to stand to give an account for what you believe. And Peter says to us, always be prepared. Always be prepared to give an answer with sympathy, with love, with compassion, not with insults, understanding people and not wanting to rile them up. We give an answer for the hope that we have. But there needs to be an, an eagerness for us to speak out for God. There needs to be a confidence that we have because He will give us the words. There needs to be not only that, but the ability to do so with, with respect and honor. When talking about our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, it's a relationship of love, of obedience, of humility, of kindness, of salvation. Why do we first want to go out and upset people by confronting them, being aggressive in our relationship to them or in the way we approach them, and then think that we're being persecuted because people are aggrieved at us and angry with us and start attacking us verbally and sometimes even physically? See, you can't upset someone and then try and tell them about the peace and the love and the joy of Jesus Christ and the way that he loved us and died for us. See, we've got to first and foremost show a life of Christ. Did Christ get into um, Pilate's face and be aggressive with him and say, you have no power over me, nothing you can do can harm me, 
I am on my own mission and I'm going to fulfill it. So you can just go and do what you ever want to do. No, he didn't. He said those words, but he did so in humility and with due respect. We need to be aware of that. God is working in and through us. Look what it says there. The eyes of the Lord are on those who do good. It's on the righteous. And his ears are attentive to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. I want the Lord to be attentive to me. And how do I do that? I live righteously. I live obediently. And I live in a, in a love relationship with God himself through the Lord Jesus Christ. When I'm eager to do good, when I, I'm seeking to do what is right, when I want to serve him in every way, just as he did in humility, just as he did in love, just as he did in obedience, I will deal with people, whether they're in the church or whether they're outside the church, whether they're antagonistic towards me, or whether they hate me as a Christian or a Christian pastor, or you as a Christian, we Treat them with respect, honesty, and love. Nothing will turn their, their hearts quicker against Christianity than us getting angry with them, aggressive with them, and trying to argue our position. We show the love of Jesus Christ. Then thirdly, as we, we, we look at the third point it talks there about living by the Spirit. Living by the Spirit. Look at verse 18 with me. And these are one of the hardest six of sets of verses in the New Testament. It says this, For Christ died for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive in the Spirit. Jesus' whole aim was to take us and bring us into a relationship with God. Now, how do we know that that relationship is true? Well, it says that through His Holy Spirit, He has given us a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance. Look what He says there, if you will, at verse uh, nine, uh, 18, second half 18. He was put to death in the body, but made alive in the Spirit. Through whom, the Holy Spirit, He also went and preached the spirits in prison who displayed long ago, and we'll, we'll deal with that in a moment. What's he saying? He's saying, it is the Holy Spirit that is with us today, guiding, governing, changing, molding us. But the main purpose of the Holy Spirit is to be a deposit guaranteeing that our salvation is real. That's the, the purpose of the Holy Spirit. The, the Spirit will guide us into truth, but Jesus must leave us. Remember in the, the upper room, he says, I must go so the Spirit, the Comforter, can come. See, Jesus couldn't be with us forever, but the Holy Spirit is the one that will guide, direct, and be that deposit on our lives. That surety that is, is paid by the blood of Jesus Christ, that our salvation is secured. What a great thing that is. For each one of us. Who are the spirits that we are preached to? He says those that are in prison. Let me unpack this for you a little bit. I'll read it first. Then we'll unpack it. He was made alive. Sorry, put to death in the body. But made alive by the spirit. Through whom he also went and preached to the spirits in prison. Who disobeyed long ago. When the God waited patiently in the days of Noah. While the ark was being built. And it only a few, eight in all, were saved through water. And this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also. Let's just unpack that. It's a difficult passage. And we need to realize that this is Peter giving an example. He's not trying to, to give us a, a way of living out of this. He's, he's saying, just as the Spirit of, of Christ wanted everybody to hear the gospel, hear the message, so 
That's what the Spirit did. These spirits that he's talking about here in verse 19 were the unbelieving, those who disobeyed, those who, who were evil. And remember, uh, back in Noah's day, we had those. It says, everybody's heart was evil all the time. And there are only eight people. I have three, eight people. Noah, his wife, his three sons and their wives. Eight people in all were saved. Jesus proclaimed the message to Noah back in Noah's day. How did he do that? The message of salvation by faith in God that he had a salvation set aside for you, that you need to live by faith, was preached by Noah. And he preached for 120 years while he was building the ark. And there was much ridicule. There are many people who who belittled him. There are many people who thought that he had gone mad. Remember, at that time, they'd had no rain. They didn't understand what a flood was. They didn't understand what it meant to, to have rain for 40 days and then nothing after that and everything being destroyed and flooded. So they thought that Noah was mad. And here he's building this massive boat. And they ridiculed him in every way. Noah's preaching the message of God to them. He preached that they need to repent. They need to put their trust in God. They need to follow him and be obedient. See, in those days they didn't have the Ten Commandments. Noah was way before Moses. But he says, believe God and that will be your salvation. Believe God and that will be your salvation. See, it was faith that saved Noah. God said to him, Noah, everyone is evil. I want you to build a boat. Can you imagine him saying, uh, yes, Lord. Uh, <laughs> why a boat? He says, well, it's going to be massive. Say, but Lord, why so big? He says, because you're going to take two of every kind of animal and your whole family and for 40 days and 40 nights, it's going to rain. Uh, okay, Lord, I'll start. But how do I do it? He says, well, it must be of a certain type of wood. It must be done in a certain way. And these are the dimensions of that boat. And we talk about Noah and the ark. And Noah, in obedience and faith, built this boat as big as it was, without understanding what a flood was, because he believed God. And because he believed God and he built the boat, God credited to him that is righteousness. It wasn't the boat that saved Noah. It was the fact that he believed God and that drove him to build the boat, build the ark. See, he believed God would judge sin. He believed that God would judge by sending the flood. He believed that God would save him and his family. And the purpose and the way of saving that and the way, the mechanism of saving that was through building the ark. He believed that God would do all of this because he is the one that had planned. And then it says here that Noah was baptized. Look with me if you will. Um, verse 21. And this water, the water that saved Noah, symbolizes baptism that now saves you also. Not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a good conscience towards God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It says, just as faith leads to baptism, and baptism is a sign of saying, I am following God and I'm fully committed to Him. Noah, yes, Noah built the ark. And once the ark was there, he climbed into the ark. And then the floods came and that water symbolizes the absolute commitment he had to God. The boat that was floating on the water was the commitment, the baptism. See, no any family were, were dry. They didn't go under the water. They were dry. But that was the commitment. That was the proof that this faith saved him. And in the same way, we believe that in baptism, 
when we are baptized, we make a commitment. And that commitment that we believe and trust and have faith in Jesus Christ is what will save us. Just as Jesus Christ promised us as we, he, he died and He rose from the dead, so too we will die, but we'll be raised to life in Him. So what does this all mean today? God would move through Peter's words and the readers of his words and he would take them safely through all their trials, through all their difficulties and give them a happy end to their trials. He said, but Tony, how can that be? See, we see it in, in terms of this world. Our happiness is how happy we can be here. Our happiness is related to, to whether things go our way. Our happiness is related to how much money we have in the bank. Our happiness is related to how we relate to others, how many people love us, how many people we love. But just as Noah put his faith in the ark that God told him to build, so we are told to put our faith in Jesus Christ. Because when the flood comes, God will take us through to the other side. For Noah, it was a new world. There were no more animals, there were no more human beings, there was nothing except what God had placed in the ark. There was nothing else. So when Noah came out, it was to a new world. How much more for us when all of this comes crashing down, whether it in life and death, that what we see, we see a new world. And that is for us in heaven. See, but we sometimes are so connected to the now, so connected to what we have now, how we are living now, what blessings I have now, what God has given me now. And the Bible says, this all passes away. Remember in, in chapter th uh, 2, it says that we are aliens and strangers in this world, but we have a joy set before us with God in heaven. See, it is Jesus Christ who has gone before us, prepared the way, made the straight paths for us that we will be saved. That one day we stand before the judgment seat of God, Jesus Christ will stand up on our behalf and say, this is my child. They committed themselves by faith to me and I am speaking on their behalf. We need to be aware that this may take a long time. There are a lot of people that are saying it's 2,000 years and your, your God hasn't worked. Surely he's lost the plot. But in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 3, it says this. First of all, you must understand that in the last days, scoffers will come scoffing and following their own evil desires. They will say, where is the coming? He promised. Ever since our fathers died, everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. And then in verse um, 8, 1 Peter 3 verse 8. But do not forget this one thing, my dear friends. With the Lord a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years is like a day. He's saying, we count over a thousand years, but they are just a day in God's sight. God is not limited by time. God is not limited by, by a calendar. God is governed by His purposes, His plan, and His love and grace. The Lord is not slow in keeping His promises, as some understand slowness. God is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. God will continue working out His plan until everybody comes to repentance. Is we are called to make a decision now and live now. Because we don't know when God will come back. Jesus himself said that. He says the hour and the time is unknown. But be ready now. Be ready now. See if we live in harmony, we understand that it's not how we are, are meeting the world in aggression. But we are meeting them with peace, with love, with showing that we have compassion and kindness. It shows that we have a relationship with God who gave us Jesus Christ, who has called us 
to live in a righteous life. Because the Lord's eyes are on the righteous. And he hears the prayers of those who call on his name. And then thirdly, as the Holy Spirit dwells within us as a deposit, the Spirit that raised Christ from the dead will raise us to life. And we are called to live lives worthy of that. Don't give up. Don't think it's been so long it'll never happen. Turn to Jesus Christ and believe and trust him. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity that we have this morning to come before you, to show our lives in a commitment to you. Lord, you know our hearts. You know our desires. We know that we are aliens and strangers in this world. But we ask that you might continue to grow us in the image of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. We want to know him more. We want to serve him more. We want to show the love and the compassion that he had in our lives. So that we might see the commitment we have that you will bless us for doing what we ought to do. And that is to be more and more like Jesus Christ. We ask this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. The Lord bless you, the Lord keep you, the Lord be with you this week as you sent yourself on him. 
And in turn, may your heart be filled to the fullness of Christ in every way. May he dwell in your heart through faith. In Jesus' name, amen.